Hello, today we're back to Leviticus, looking at chapter 2, talking about the grain offering. And if anyone here enjoys cooking, there's a little bit of it uh, for you in this chapter. Often we're not told in great detail what the meaning or purpose of the sacrifice might be. And it's interesting that the book and the, the texts that deal with these offerings and sacrifices have a kind of a built-in expiration date in the particulars in that we may not understand as fully as they did. Nobody's able to actually perform them in the way they're supposed to be performed because the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. But we can look at the principles behind the sacrifices, behind the offerings. We can look at what the people of the time would have thought about in relation to their own history and what it said to them. And it has been said that to understand a people, a uh, society, and their values, you have to understand their rituals. And in this case, we're looking at understanding uh, God's values and what God is trying to communicate to them uh, through these rituals. And sometimes, not understanding might be the point. And we'll see this uh, in a later lesson. So, this chapter is about the grain offering and... Um, you can read for yourself here, uh, but perhaps I will read it. When anyone brings a grain offering as an offering to the Lord, this offering shall be a fine flour. There's something wrong with the verse numbers there. He shall pour oil on, oil on it and put frankincense on it and bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests, and he shall take it from, from it a handful of the fine flour and oil with all of its frankincense, and the priest shall burn this as its memorial portion on the altar, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. But the rest of the grain offering shall be for Aaron and his sons. It is a most holy part of the Lord's food offerings. When you bring a grain offering baked in the oven as an offering, it shall be unleavened loaves of fine flour mixed with oil or unleavened wafers smeared with oil. And if your offering is a grain offering baked on a griddle, it shall be a fine flour unleavened mixed with oil. You shall break it in pieces and pour oil on it. It is a grain offering. And if your offering is a grain offering cooked in a pan, it shall be made of fine flour with oil. And you shall bring the grain offering that is made of these things to the Lord. And when it is presented to the priest, he shall bring it to the altar. And the priest shall take from the grain offering its memorial portion and burn this on the altar, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. But the rest of the grain offering shall be for Aaron and his sons, it is a most holy part of the Lord's food offerings. No grain offering that you bring to the Lord shall be made with leaven, for you shall burn no leaven nor any honey as a food offering to the Lord. As an offering of first fruits, you may bring them to the Lord, but they shall not be offered on the altar for a pleasing aroma. You shall season all your grain offerings with salt. You shall not let the salt of the covenant with your God be missing from your grain offering. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. If you offer a grain offering of first fruits to the Lord, you shall offer for the grain offering of your first fruits fresh ears, roasted with fire, crushed new grain, and you shall put oil on it and lay frankincense on it. It is a grain offering, and the priest shall burn it as its memorial portion, some of the crushed grain and some of the oil with all of its frankincense. It is a food offering to the Lord. So as we read through this, uh, we note who was invited. Was it voluntary or required? How does this compare to the burnt offering? What is optional, required, or prohibited? What is different if it's a first fruits offering? And so first we see that everyone was invited to present uh, a grain offering. It was voluntary. Compared to the burnt offering, there is no animal life, no meat, no life, no blood involved, and no mention of atonement. We note that there are different kinds of preparations accepted. Oil, oil with oil and salt. So salt was required. But honey and leaven were not allowed to be burned. They were allowed for a first fruits offering, but not burned as a pleasing aroma. And we also note that the word used for honey might refer to uh, some kind of, also refer to uh, any kind of nectar, uh, for example, from dates. The meaning is of sweetness. Now we note that this offering was always offered following the official daily burnt offering, which was done twice a day. Now what are we told about the purpose of this offering? 
Well, if you read through the text, there's not a whole lot said about this. But again, we remember that it was something that the people of the time were very, very familiar with. Now, uh, some rabbinic commentators have suggested that perhaps this is a poor man's burnt offering. If they compare it to chapter 5, verses 11 to 13. So let's see what we can uncover. What are we told about the meaning of the offering? Not a whole lot. The word used for uh, this offering is minha, which means a gift or a present. Uh, it refers to animal or cereal offerings. Uh, it could also mean something like a tribute. How Jacob presented a gift to Esau to uh, try to earn his favor. Or what Jacob uh, presented to Joseph uh, when he was prime minister. What are your impressions of this offering? Find flour. What is the significance of it? What was involved in the production of the flour or bread? Let's think about that a bit. And what does this tell us about this offering? Of course, it seems a little bit mundane. Um, just flour, uh, fine flour. Um, it seems kind of ordinary in a sense. Uh, it is the choice part of the wheat from the inner kernels. Uh, it could also be a barley. And so one thing it seems to say is that it's still, although it, it seems mundane and just flour in a, you know, in a sense, it's only flour, it's still the best. Uh, what was involved in the production of this flour? Uh, think about it. It was produced by grinding grain in millstones. Uh, this was a really labor-intensive um, daily human labor. Uh, it also involved kneading of the dough, and uh, finally, in some cases, if you want it, it could involve cooking. Again, to bake bread, you would knead the flour and water and oil and salt together, and then bake it. So what does this tell us about this offering? What is the, what is the flavor, so to speak? Well, it is something ordinary uh, from everyday labor, from our everyday work, daily human labor. It is a gift to God of something ordinary from everyday life, from our everyday work. What does the oil signify? Well, if we look in the Old Testament uh, for some clues, for example, we see the oil. Oil is associated with the Spirit of the Lord, the work of the Spirit. Uh, we also see, for example, in Isaiah 61, the oil of gladness, right, instead of mourning, the oil of gladness. Uh, and also in Proverbs, oil and perfume make the heart glad. So gladness and joy are associated with oil. And what does this tell us about work? Well, one way of looking at it is that what we're offering we still we owe it to the working of the Spirit in us. The Spirit transforms our gifts, our daily work, into a worthy offering. It's a consecration of our daily work to the Lord. What other purpose did this offering serve? Why is it called most holy? Where could it be eaten? And how does this inform us today? Well, um, we see that part of the offering goes to feed the priests. And so this speaks of God's care and providence for the priests. And as such, it could only be eaten in a holy place. Now again, we think of it as just flour or just bread, but it is called most holy because it is a reserve for the priests. So this seems to speak to the importance of providing for God's servants. And we see echoes of this in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians 9 and Luke 10. This passage speaks of a pleasing aroma. Can we think of examples of an aroma pleasing to God in the New Testament? Well, we should think of Mary Magdalene anointing Jesus' feet in John 12. We can think of Paul when he was a prisoner writing that he's spreading the fragrance of Christ in 2 Corinthians 2. He writes, But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of Him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved, and among those who are perishing, 
to one a fragrance from death to death, to the other a fragrance from life to life. And when speaking of the offering from the Church of Philippi, this is also called a pleasing aroma. Now think about the sources of this aroma. What happens to them, and how can this encourage us? So what happens to them? Well, the aroma arises from something that is burned up or used up, and may appear to us to be wasted, but it is a pleasing aroma to God. As we are being used up in a sense, as our lives are being used up, as our offerings are being used up, in fact, they're not wasted. They're pleasing to God. And we should find this encouraging in that sense. Nothing is wasted. Nothing that we offer is wasted. What about this whole thing about salt? What does salt signify? And we see that it's called the salt of the covenant. What does that mean? Well, for example, in Numbers 18, verse 19, we see the phrase, an everlasting covenant of salt before the Lord. So what does the salt signify about the standing and duties of the worshiper with regards to God? Well, of course, salt uh, speaks to taste and flavor and also its uh, qualities that preserve things. And in the Middle East, it is a sign of hospitality, of friendship, of bonds, and of course, of covenant. Uh, the Greeks and Arabs are known to have eaten salt together when they concluded covenants. In the Old Testament, salt is connected with covenants on two occasions. And in both, a covenant of salt means an internal covenant. So, for example, in Numbers 18, uh, 2 Chronicles 13, verse 5. A salt was regarded as something that could not be, be destroyed by fire or time or any other means in antiquity. So to add salt to the offering was a reminder that the worshiper was an internal covenant relationship with God, an everyday reminder or a memorial that we are his people, we are in covenant, and we are called and so in the same way in Matthew 5, verse 13, it is a reminder of our eternal covenant with God, our relationship with God, and our calling to take over Israel's mission. So in other words, be salty. Yeast and honey. Why are they prohibited for this offering, but they are okay for a different offering? What does that offering signify? And we know that yeast and honey can also be eaten with the thanks offering in chapter 7 and given for the wave offering in chapter 23. Well, we see it's okay for the offering of first fruits, uh, but it should not be burned. So why were they forbidden for this offering? Well, no rationale is given here. Here are some suggestions. Uh, one, that it is uh, these two, yeast and honey, are associated with fermentation, with corruption, of course, the honey also could speed fermentation. Uh, perhaps the fact that they are living, in a sense, uh, they're living uh, organisms inside them, or perhaps that they are <laughs> someone else's work. The yeast is doing work, and uh, the honey is the product of uh, some other uh, organism's work, uh, the product of the work of bees, perhaps. Another suggestion, of course, is that honey... Uh, might have been closely associated with pagan rituals. And in the end, we don't really have a definitive answer for that. Uh, but again, when we look at the question of prohibited foods, we'll come back to the suggestion that perhaps the understanding or the not understanding is the important thing. So as a recap, this offering is a gift or a tribute to God. And what do we make of it? That it is flour or bread. Again, that it is the uh, re representation of our everyday food and labor. It is something that anyone can offer. What would be the effect upon the worshiper? Well, it would be a way of remembering God throughout the day, even at work, uh, even at meals, both uh, in the preparation and the eating. Uh, the reminders of God's jurisdiction, of his care, like when God remembered Noah, asking God to remember us, for example, in Revelations 5, verse 8, uh, keeping our relationship, our covenant relationship in the forefront. So as far as memorial, 
that could be some of the meanings. Remembering God or asking God to remember us. It is also a reminder that all we do and all we have comes from God. We are stewards of what he allows us to have. Why so many options for this offering? Well, I like to think that it is to provide variety for the priests, uh, for one thing, and it's a sign of God's care and special attention. And also, perhaps, speaking to our own special or unique contributions in terms of our work, our choices, perhaps. Something a little bit more personal. And again, what is the source of the pleasing aroma? It comes from what is burned or used up, and yet it is not wasted. It is pleasing to God. So we recap here. The gift represents our everyday food and labor. It helps us to think about God throughout the day, even at work or our meal times. Reminders of God's jurisdiction and care. All we do and have is God's. We are just stewards. And it speaks perhaps to our unique work, our contributions, our personality, and providing variety for the priests. And the fact that it is a memorial uh, works both ways. For us to remember God and for, for asking God to remember us. The aroma, again, is from what is burned or used up. So what does this say to us today? What does this say about our work, our everyday tasks? What does this say about our work-life balance? Are we workaholics? What is it? Is that something that is pleasing to God? Or do we need to take a step back and look at how our work fits into the rest of our life? Uh, is it pleasing to God, our work? Is it pleasing to God how we regard and treat our work in relation to the rest of our lives, especially our families? Other things we, we do which may seem like a waste of our time, but may instead be fragrant offerings to God. So our work, whatever it may be, as long as it's honorable, is still a fragrant offering to God. Are we supporting God's workers? Are we giving them enough support? What does it re mean to remember our covenant call to be God's people in this world? So, in closing, I have a recommendation. If you want to uh, look for the videos by Tabernacle Man, uh, they're very, very interesting. Uh, he tries to provide more visual representations including costumes and props, uh, of what these offerings might have looked like. Uh, I've referred to Skip Heidzig's sermons on Leviticus as well, and they're very, uh, very uh, good for insight and application. And next we'll look at chapter 3. But reflecting on chapter 2, we can ask what service can we offer to God today. Thanks for watching. And uh, if you haven't subscribed already, uh, please do so. Thank you.